And so let's stand up and let's sing about Jesus and worship his name. Free! 
joy to the world.
need to look past you to find what we need Jesus we cannot find holiness past you you are holiness Jesus thank you Lord 
Thank you, Jesus, that you dwell in us. Thank you, God, that the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world stands at the door and knocks. Where is Jesus in your heart this morning? Have you let him in? Are you eating a meal with him? Are you dwelling in his presence? Or is he still knocking? Open the door. Open the door. Let him in. Do not delay. Do not push it back any longer. The Father's love is so strong for you that he keeps his son knocking at your door day and night, just hoping that he can have relationship with you and that he can cleanse you and bring you into his family, give you part of his inheritance. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, let your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, just move in this place. Let there be an awakening in this place, Holy Spirit. Move in our hearts. Let rivers of living water just begin to flow through us. Let the jars of olive oil overflow this morning. Pour out a fresh anointing on your people this morning, Lord. Prepare our hearts to receive your word and to be changed, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. You can go ahead and be seated. What a great morning. Thank you so much for being here. If you're new or you haven't been here in a while, we really want to get to know you. So please go online and fill out a Connect card. That's also an awesome spot to leave prayer requests. Or if you have any questions too, that's a great spot for that. So that's all online. I just want to take a moment and celebrate too that we had over 210 families pick up Christmas spectacular packages. And, yeah, we can clap for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we, had, we filled over 330 shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. That's amazing. Thank you, church, for your generosity. And thank, thank you for your faithful giving. And we actually have a special announcement right now from our pastor's council about our pastor's offering. Life Center, we are a church who believes wholeheartedly in honor. Each year, we take a Sunday during the Christmas season to honor our pastor and the entire staff who lead us faithfully to be more like Jesus. Romans 12.10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. We believe honor can be expressed in a tangible fashion. We, as the Pastors Council, set aside one Sunday a year to receive all financial gifts to bless our team at Life Center. It is a moment to express our collective appreciation for how they faithfully serve us week after week. The Pastors Offering will take place Sunday, December 20th. We ask you to prayerfully consider how you would like to bless the team at Life Center. Thank you on behalf of the Pastors Council. And just a few more announcements too. So one, if you're a young adult, uh, please tune in tonight. We have um, a Zoom meeting tonight for young adults and we're going to be talking about racism and ethnic discrimination. This is an important conversation and it's an opportunity for us to come together and let God expose the darkness of our hearts to us so that he can purify us and remove the sin from our life. So if you're a young adult, you can sign up for that online. And another thing too, 1 Corinthians 12.26 says that when mom, one member of the church suffers, all suffer together. So let's come around those who have been hurt and behave in the way that God has designed the church to behave. Secondly, we have a new Bible school, school term starting. Uh, I think we have some courses on prophets, biblical boundaries, and pneumatology. I don't even know what pneumatology is, but if you join the, the Bible school, I bet you'll find out. So... Again, you can sign up for that online. And then lastly, if you're a junior high or a youth, we have a 613 Christmas celebration. I think it's happening on December 11th. Uh, yeah, December 11th, 7 p.m. Uh, so come on out, uh, dress up, bring a mask, bring a friend, leave COVID at home, and we're going to have a great time with that. <laughs> so uh, now I'm just going to, we're going to show you a video of our kids singing some Christmas carols, and then Pastor Lori's going to come up and bring the message to us today.
My gosh, how cute is that? I love our kids so much. So sweet. That was challenging. They all had to submit videos, and then one of our students spliced all that together. So, so cute. Well, what a great way to start our Christmas season, our Christmas series. Oh, we are so excited, and I'm so happy to see each of you here today. Wow, it is such an exciting time to come together, to worship God, to lift his name high, and I know the Holy Spirit is already profoundly at work in this place, so may the Lord continue to do what he has started today. Well, we are excited in our Christmas series right now because we are talking about God with us. I want you to say God with us because that is a profound revelation that God wants to bring to our hearts and to our lives in a deeper way this year at Christmas. And our kids remind me of Christmas. How better? <laughs> Christmas is for kids, right? If you've got the little ones, I've got teenagers now, and I miss that age, the excitement. And kids represent the slowness, right? The waiting, getting the Christmas tree up, putting some presents under the tree, waiting for the presents to be opened. That slowness that they have to wait, and it feels like forever ever for it to come. The higher the degree of anticipation, the greater level of slowness that seems to be in time that we experience. And as we focus and fixate and anticipate on something that's coming in the future, something we're waiting for, something we desire with all of our heart, inevitably time seems to slow to a halt. And sometimes the truth is we get a bit weary in that waiting can't we? We get frustrated and weary in the waiting. Our posture in waiting is actually what begins to reveal where we have placed our trust. Now, as adults, slowness hits different. It hits completely different at Christmas time. Because the truth is that, yes, many of us get excited for Christmas. I love Christmas. But the truth is that for probably half of us, Christmas is just a reminder of things we're still waiting for. Maybe broken relationships in family, maybe memories of a difficult childhood. Christmas brings up all of this stuff with it, with all of the joy and celebration. It brings up all of this pain and this sense of waiting. God, will this 
Christmas finally be different. So wherever you are at today, whether you come in so excited that it's Christmas, celebrating the season, or whether there's a little bit of dread in there, whether you're wondering if this Christmas is yet going to be just another reminder of things lost, no matter where you stand on that today, I know and you know that the Christmas story does not change. And so I want us in this moment, to speak to our spirit. Sometimes we actually have to speak to our spirit, speak truth to our spirit. And I want us together to speak to our spirit and to say, God is with me. Say it out loud. God is with me. We're going to speak that to our spirit today. Well, 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. All right, the sum in that word is you and me. We're the sum that count what slowness looks like. The truth is that anything that doesn't happen on our timeline, we consider slow, don't we? We're like, come on already. Listen, I'm a little bit of like a fast-paced person, so if things aren't happening on my timeline, I can be like, all right, let's get to this already. Now, I want to see a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Are you a patient person? Thumbs up if you are. On the chat, put a thumb up. Thumbs down if you're not. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Patience? Come on, where do we fall on that? Listen, the truth is, and I bet you're like me, I consider myself somewhat of a patient person. I'm easygoing. I'm laid back, except when I'm not. Right? Isn't that how it is? It seems like in some situations, we can have all the patience in the world. We can wait, we can be at rest, and then in other situations, we're like, come on, come on, come on, come on. I remember when my kids were babies, and it came to the age of spoon feeding. You know, when you take a tiny little bit on that tiny, tiny, tiny spoon, and and you have to get through that entire bowl, and it actually takes like 20 or 25 minutes for this tiny bowl of food. And you have to do this multiple times a day. And I remember in that stage of of babies, I was like, oh, oh my gosh. Anytime my mom would come to visit, I'd be like, mom, would you like to feed the baby? She'd be like, oh yes, it's so wonderful. She'd be all excited. I'm like, oh thank goodness. Like I did not enjoy that season. All right. How about, this is our reality right now. How about you're heading out to the store and you've got a certain amount of time, right? You've got like, you're, you're on the clock. You've got a certain amount of time and you get to the store and there's a lineup outside the store because of COVID before you even get in the store to do your shopping and then wait in another line and then wait in another line. <laughs> Listen, ain't nobody got time for that, right? Like really, we don't have time for this. Like waiting outside before we even get to our shopping. That's just a reality of our day right now. And traffic, of course, How many just despise hitting traffic? And when you get there and you're just sitting there and you're like, oh, I have to be somewhere. But we also experience this slowness, this painful slowness in the hard things in life. Waiting between prayers prayed and prayers answered. Sitting in the waiting of that time. Waiting for someone we love, someone we're in relationship with to change because the relationship just isn't working as it is. Waiting for a healing, waiting for a spiritual breakthrough, a spiritual breakthrough that we're desperate for. Waiting to get pregnant, waiting to meet that person, that person that you wanna be with. The waiting can be painful and difficult. And slowness in these things that we desperately want, the things we desperately want to see happen, lead us straight into these places of frustration and bitterness and resentment. And where is God? God with us. God with us. You see, if our trust is fixated on the outcome of all of these things that we want and desire, we, we set ourselves up for the enemy to sow into our heart, questioning, can I really trust God? Can I really rely on his character and who he is? You see, when we put our trust in who God is and what he has promised, regardless of what we see, we actually take ourselves out of this slowness of time in the waiting And we can see the provision of God in the moment. 
So how do we find confidence in the promise, the promise that seems to take forever? Let's take a look at God's track record. Promise delivered, promise fulfilled. Now here's a fun fact for you. There are over 2,366 promises about Jesus found in the Old Testament alone. And if you read through the Old Testament, what you find is the Old Testament is story after story after story pointing to the person of Jesus. It's story after story reminding us how we as humanity fail, as we as humanity fall short and we need rescue. We are in need of saving. Over and over again, the stories and the people get themselves into these situations where they're like, finally, God, where are you? I need you. And it's a reminder. It's all pointing to this story, the story of a coming savior and our need to be saved. Now, Louis Lapides, he's an expert on Old Testament prophecy, and he explains the same odds of anybody in history, even fulfilling eight of these prophecies, is best understood like this. And this is for the, from the case for Christ. It says, imagine that you took loonies, enough that would cover the entire province of Ontario to a depth of two feet. You marked one loony among all of them, then had a blindfolded person wander around the whole province, bend down to pick up one loony, what would be the odds if they choose the one that had been marked? Those are the same statistical odds that anybody in history could have fulfilled just eight of these prophecies about Jesus. Now, we're not going to focus on stats today. We are going to focus on promises. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, talked a lot about the birth of Christ. He prophesied a lot about his birth in the book of Isaiah. And the interesting part is that Isaiah wrote these words 700 years before the actual birth of Christ. And many scholars believe that he believed he was actually going to see the birth of Christ. So even what we're talking about a moment ago, in the waiting, Isaiah himself, as God revealed these prophecies to him, thought, Hmm, I wonder who it's going to be. I wonder how these prophecies are going to be fulfilled. I believe I will see it in my day. He prophesied in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now we fast forward 700 years and we see in Luke 1, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. All right, so it's not just Isaiah. What about Abraham? All right, we see in Galatians 3, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed, might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. In Jesus, God fulfills that promise as well. And we see the fulfillment in Acts 10.43. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. Promise fulfilled. You see, the promise was given to Isaiah of the coming of Jesus, and he received the revelation and he wrote it down. But for 700 years, generation after generation after generation, they had to share this promise with their mouth and with what they read in reading. They had to read it over and over and over again to remember through brokenness, through all kinds of trials and struggles and all kinds of times where people said, I'm not sure, I'm gonna take this into my own hands. Oh God, no, we need a savior. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. You see, when God speaks to us, it often goes through our finite and limited understanding of, of what that might mean or what that might look like. Can you imagine as this prophecy came, what Isaiah might have been thinking as he tried to figure all this out? Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. Okay, so number one, God is going to come through a woman, just like every other person comes into the world. Okay, hmm. What? Like, that doesn't sound that special, does it? And I'm sure he was wondering, who could this woman be? I wonder who she is. And I'm sure he looked around and thought, maybe it's this person. Maybe it's that person. 
And then a virgin will conceive, okay, um, double what? I'm not sure how that will happen, but <laughs> okay. And a baby would be born, a son that would be God. What? So these things that were normal, these things that we saw every single day, were going to have something special, something unique. Again, it was going to make it difficult for people to believe it, to see it. A promise, God with us. God dwelt in the flesh with us. The, the, the prophecy was, behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, but the promise was that God would be with us. God would be with us. You see, God wants to get our eyes off the outcome, off the natural, and get our eyes onto the eternal. You see, in light of eternity, 700 years is just a blip. Yes, for those people, that would have been a long time to wait for the fulfillment of that prophecy. But to God, and in light of eternity, 700 years is short. Even Abraham, Abraham himself bears a son in his own age, but he doesn't see the fullness of the fulfillment of the prophecy that was spoken over him, but we're living the fullness of that today. You know, many people today are talking about Christ's return. Christ coming back, the rapture, the return of Jesus. We hear it all over the place. Many believers have a deep sense in their spirit that, that the end of times is coming near, that, that there is actually the, the prophecies about Christ returning and the end times and us going to be with him, that the time is drawing near. And as we look at the world and we see more and more prophecies fulfilled, there is this sense in the spirit of many, many people that that time is coming. You see, there was a promise in the scripture that Jesus would come and bring the good news. The good news that we see in Luke 4, 18 to 21. For the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it says he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It was, pro it was prophesied that Jesus would teach in parables. And Matthew 13 says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Once again, promise declared, promise delivered. You see, a clock was started with each of these prophecies and promises. Okay, Lord, you said this, you're revealing this, you promised this, so when is it going to happen? And as we start to try to imagine and try to picture and try to put it all together, this anticipation stirs in our spirit, and at the same time, a sense of slowness, because we're not seeing what we hope to see. But what if all of this, all of what is happening, what happened back then, what's happening even now, what if this sense of urgency that we sense of the time is not as much about the outcome, is not as much about what is going to happen, as it is about the urgency to actually share this good news that we have? What if men for all of time, even Isaiah back when he received this prophecy, felt this sense, I have to tell people, I have to declare this good news that Jesus is coming. Coming. What if that sense happens in every single generation? Because that is what we're called to do. We're called to share the good news with the world because we don't want one person to miss the promise that God is with us. God is with us here and now. You see, God was faithful to Abraham, to Isaiah, to all the prophets to fulfill his promises, even though statistically it's impossible to do so. What are the promises that you are holding on to today? Those desires of your heart, those prayers prayed, those things that you're so desperate for God to move in. 
What if the answer is not found in the outcome, but in the promise that God is with you in the midst of what it is that you're walking right now and that you can put your absolute trust and your absolute faith in who he is because he's faithful to fulfill all his promises. You know, God has been talking to me a little bit about 2021, about some things that he has on my heart for us to do, and I'm really, really excited about it, and a little bit overwhelmed and a little bit scared as well, a little bit afraid to step out in some new ways that that I feel like are beyond what I can do in my own strength. And even this morning, as I woke up a little bit overwhelmed and I just began to pray through some of the things that I wanted God to do, I could feel the very thing. I'm sharing with you today happening that all of my prayers were about the outcome. God, would you do this? Would you do it in this way? This is what I need. And I literally just felt this alignment, this correction come in my spirit. Can you trust that I am with you? And that is all that you have need of. You see, we as pastors come up and we we preach the word, but God is working this word out on us every day. Every day we have to wake up and again, relinquish control of what I want, the way that I want it and give it back to God and trust him to work. Because the promise that we need to grab hold of, the promise we need to speak to our spirit every single day is that his name is Emmanuel, which means, let me hear it, God with us. Our promise is that no matter what, let me hear it, God with us in the promise and in the slowness. Say it again, God with us. Throughout the Bible, we see these words again and again, fear not, fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. I wonder if it's not as much a rebuke, but a reminder of the promise that God is with us. Because God was with us, because God was with the men and women of old, they did not have to be afraid. This is the heart cry, the message of a loving God saying, I'm going before you. I will fight for you. I will go before you. I have got you and I am with you. And because I am with you, you do not have to be afraid. But there's a battle. There's a battle between our will and God's will. There's a battle between our way and God's way. But when our way becomes God's way, no matter what the outcome of our prayers, no matter what it is that we actually see, we can trust that God is with us. Now, have you ever had someone speak a prophetic word over you that you've yet to see come to pass? Have you ever had someone prophesy something and speak something over your life and you've yet to see it come to pass? Well, I believe that this is a time of acceleration in the spirit where prophetic words are coming to pass. Those words that have been spoken over you are coming to pass. And I encourage you, step out. Step in faith in what has been spoken over you and what has been promised by the word of God. Step out in those words. I remember when I was a young, like in my 20s, early 20s, and someone prophesied over me and they said, you're going to be a leader of leaders. And I kind of responded in my spirit very much like Gideon, like, well, don't you kind of have to be a leader first to be a leader of leaders? Like I am not even a leader. So how is that going to happen? But sure enough, very slowly, slowly over time with small steps of obedience and small yeses, that prophecy came true. And honestly, that couldn't have happened in and of my own strength. It was supernatural and from God alone. But I believe with all my heart that if there are words that have been spoken over your life, step into them, grab hold of them, go back and read them and allow the spirit of God to awaken those things in your life. Now, I want to tell you a little story from 1 Samuel 23, and I really encourage you to read it at home. It's one chapter and it is awesome. It's an awesome, awesome story. And it's a story of David who is in the midst of a slowness season of his life. He's in the midst 
of waiting. He has been anointed king. He's been prophesied he would be the king, but he's not the king. And and I wonder if that 15-year period from the time that that was spoke over him to the time it actually came to fruition, if he was like, oh my goodness, this is slow. Yes, absolutely. Have you read the Psalms? Have you read his prayers? Yes, it was a time of slowness for him. So in this story, David asks God, he says, the Philistines are attacking this small little town of Keilah. And he says, he asks God very specifically, God, should we go fight for them? Should we go defend them? Should we stand up for them? And God says, yes, you need to go and fight. So David goes back to his men and he says, this is what God said we need to do. And the men said, oh no, we can't do that. We can't fight against the Philistines. We're afraid. David goes back to God and God says, fear not for I am with you. Tell them, fear not for I am with you. He's going to go and he's going to fight for them. So he tells them and they go and they go and they fight. Do you ever ask God specific questions like that? I mean, I mean, really specific questions like, God, what do you have for me today? God, should I do this or should I do that? God, should I go back to school? Should I change jobs? Should I move? God, should I marry this person? Do you ask God very specific questions? Because God wants to have a very personal and very specific relationship with you. And he wants to help lead you and guide you just like David did in that moment. God, should we go and do this? This is an opportunity. Should we do it? God said, yes. You can talk to God like that about your life. I know for myself, I ask God very specific questions sometimes, especially when I'm in a season of, I really don't know what to do, or maybe there's multiple things that I could do. I sit and I wait and I say, God, I need you to give me direction. I need you to tell me what to do. But there are other times when I don't really want to know the answer, so I don't ask. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) There are times when maybe we do already know the answer, and we don't really want it to be confirmed, so we don't ask, (laughs) and we go ahead. You know, Jason and I, this week, we took a reconciliation step, a step that we felt like God said, I want you to do this. We wouldn't have thought of it in our own minds and in our own hearts, but he said, I want you to do this, and we took a step this week, a reconciliation step. And it wasn't like, there weren't fireworks. It wasn't like this crazy, you know, anything crazy or anything like that that happened as a result. But once we finished, I felt this sense in my spirit. Like we just pushed darkness back just a little bit more. Like just the darkness that that wanted to come in just got pushed back a little bit more. And just a little bit more light was let in. And, you know, sometimes we overcomplicate it. We think that it's more complicated than that. But every single time we make an obedient step, every single time we make one step to say, I'm going to do what you've asked me to do, even though it's hard, even though it's uncomfortable, we push back the darkness and just let in a little bit more light, a little bit more of the light and the power of God into our lives. And so David and his men, they go and they fight and they win. And there's victory and they're celebrating. Yet in the very next verse, David catches wind that Saul and his army are going to come to this little town of Keilah because Saul wants to kill David. And so they're on their way and they're going to come against David. And David catches wind of that and he goes back to God very specifically again. And he says, God, is Saul's army on their way? God says, yes, they are. And he says, okay, well, will this town of Kayla, will Kayla protect us? Will, will they betray, protect us or will they betray us? And God says, they're going to betray you. They literally just stuck their necks out. They just risked their lives to protect this little town. And now God's saying to them, they will not stand up for you in this and fight against Saul's army. They will not. So David and his men flee. And, and, and I want you to know that sometimes in life, sometimes in our relationships, that the very people that we stand up for, the very people that we fight for, the very people that we put our necks out for, sometimes turn around and betray us. Because the truth is that people cannot stand the full weight of our trust. Only God can stand the full weight of our trust. People will let us down. Husbands and wives will let each other down. Parents and children will let each other, st- each other down. Brothers and sisters will let each other down. Friends and colleagues, people you stick your neck out for, will let you down. But God will never let you down. And so David and his men run, and they hide. And God actually hides them in the stronghold. 
And so you see this beautiful contrast in this story where David and his men go and fight and win over the stronghold of the enemy, of the Philistines, and then they're hidden in the stronghold under the shadow of God's wings. And I believe that as we step out and we trust God's promises, that's exactly what happens to us. Though both of those things that, again, we fight and we overcome the stronghold of the enemy, and at the same time we're protected under the shadow of under the stronghold of Christ and under the shadow of his wings. And those are two beautiful, beautiful results of putting our trust in the promises of God and not in the work of men. And I believe this story is very personal for some of you today because some of you can feel and can sense the darkness pressing in. Some of you feel it all around you and, you, and you, and you're tired and you're weary because you're, you're holding it back. You're trying to hold it back with prayers. Some of you have been betrayed or even maybe right now are being betrayed by someone you stuck your neck out for. Some of you are desperate for God to move on your behalf and you feel like you've been waiting forever. Such slowness, but the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness. His promises will be fulfilled on his timeline. And we've got to fix our eyes on eternity to know that God is faithful to deliver his promises. And so the real question should not be, how do you count slowness? But the question should be, can you trust God? to fulfill his promises. Is he trustworthy in keeping his word? In John 1, verses 9 to 14, it says, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world, and he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory and the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. He was faithful to Abraham. He was faithful to Isaac. He was faithful to Isaiah and all the prophets And he will be faithful to you too. Lord, would you help us to change our measure of slowness to see that all your promises are true and you are faithful and good to fulfill them. And the final promise, whether you are walking in a season of celebration or hiding or mourning, whether you're having good times or hard times, whether you're in sickness or in health or in life or in death, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Church, let me hear it, which means God with us. And this is the promise of Christmas, that whether in big or small things, God is with us, and we do not have to be afraid. And this good news doesn't just change change something, it changes everything everything. You see, when Jesus came on the scene, it changed everything. And I know I need to be reminded every single day that God is with me. And so we have a very special gift for everyone today as a reminder that God is with you. Pastor Soraya designed this really, really neat downloadable print of our series titled God With Us. And you can print it, and I framed it. This one's going in my house. And it can be a reminder. Put it up on your fridge. Put it in your bathroom. Put it wherever you need to be reminded every day that as you go through what you're going through, as you're waiting in the slowness, that God is with you and he is faithful. We can put the full weight of our trust in knowing that he is good and he will fulfill his promise. And as we sit in this tension of the slowness and the waiting, Sax is going to sing a song of peace over us. May that peace of God be your guide as you know and as you anchor in the truth and the promise that God is with us.
hope seems like a ship that's lost at sea My enemies on every side And I'm tempted to run and hide Your gentle whisper reaches out to me The terror of the night sets in But I can feel your angels all around I am resting underneath The shelter of your mighty wings Your promises are where my hope is found So I will not be afraid God, you always keep me safe In your arms I remember who you are You're the God whose name So I will not be afraid God, you always, you always keep me safe You give me peace That holds me when I'm broken Sweet peace That passes on I hope that today, through the service and through worship, we've had a revelation that God is with us. And through the week, don't forget that. Hold, hold on to that truth and speak it to your spirit. And don't forget to download the artwork and put it up somewhere and look at it. And when you see it, just speak it out over yourself. There's power in a spoken word. Thank you so much for being here. What an amazing Sunday. A few reminders before you go. Um, Christmas Eve, register 
uh, the three o'clock and the five o'clock services are almost full. Don't worry though, if they get full, we're gonna open up at seven o'clock, but get on there and if you wanna be there, register as soon as you can. And also to the junior high and uh, the youth, don't forget to sign up for this 613 Christmas special. And with that, thank you so much for joining us online. I hope you have an amazing Sunday. And those of you that are here, the ushers will come and dismiss you. God bless you.